Hello class, so I'm coming at you from uh, my home in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I don't know if you can see me very well, I'm having a little trouble with lighting, um, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll make this work anyway. I want to talk to you um, today about uh, Matthew, um, I'm sorry, about Luke and Acts. Um, Two different, the next two lectures are on Luke and on Acts. Um, real quickly, some background on Luke and Acts. Luke and Acts um, are probably best not thought of as two different books, but rather as two volumes of one whole book. Many New Testament scholars see Luke and Acts as a two-volume work which seeks to narrate the epic story of God's mighty acts of salvation. So, Luke's gospel is one of the three synoptic gospels that we talked about that is clearly written to the Christian believer and the established Christian church. Um, the introduction, verses 1 through 4 of chapter 1, give us a hint of what we to, are to expect. It's an ordered account um, written to a certain man named Theophilus, which in Greek means God lover, um, and seeks to tell the truth of the gospel. So, the Greek for truth here is um, a word which means firmness, certainty, security. And so when we talk about truth, we're talking about uh, the word that, when you think firmness or security, it's the word that we get uh, the word asphalt from, foundation. Um, this gospel provides the foundation, Luke is saying, for understanding everything that God does in the work of salvation following Jesus. Um, and so uh, it's important to understand that Luke is, pro is providing the foundation for what he sees as an ongoing story, which he will continue in Acts. Um, identifying Jesus in Luke, identifying the followers and discipleship in Acts, and what the church begins to look like in the New Testament. It's also to note that in contrast to Mark's gospel, um, which is very a, a, a very rough style written for the common people. Luke's gospel is a really profound literary achievement. Um, it is probably written to a very cultured, educated audience who's very familiar with the Hellenistic and Roman world. Um, like Matthew, Luke uh, takes the basic plot of Mark as his starting point, as a synoptic gospel, um, but he makes changes to the text to improve the style, to make it sound more refined, to make it sound more educated, um, to make it appeal more um, to the Greek and Hellenistic world of his time. Luke is also, um, many people think Luke was a doctor, um, and so Luke is very much concerned with facts. Uh, in many cases, Luke is often referred to as the church's first historian. And so instead of placing so much emphasis on what Jesus did and said, um, I'm sorry, instead of placing so much emphasis on Jesus's inner thoughts and his feelings, um, a whole lot more emphasis in Luke's gospel is placed upon what he did and upon what he said. Um, so that's, that's very important. Most scholars agree that Luke was clearly written um, after the fall of the Jewish temple in uh, 70 AD, so probably around 75 to 85 AD, but maybe as late as 100 AD. Um, and an important point is that in contrast to Matthew's gospel, which is clearly addressed to Christ Jewish Christians, um, or Jews who are seeking to understand the importance of Christianity as a Jesus as a Jew and Christianity as a Jewish movement. Um, Luke's gospel is written more likely to address the Gentile or non-Jewish Christians at this time. Um, it's unclear who the historical Luke is. A lot of people think of him as a um, doctor, as someone who is certainly educated, and probably a fellow companion of Paul on his missionary journeys. So someone who um, very, very much um, is understands the Christian message and is concerned through a certain kind of mission 
to see this gospel um, uh, spread throughout the world. Um, so that's a little introduction to Luke, um, and also to Luke Acts as a two-volume work. What I want to do is talk about two things. I want to look at Luke um, 4, 16 through 30, which is one of your uh, key um, passages, one of the passages that you're assigned to read for this week. Um, and through that, talk about three themes or three, three motifs that are common throughout Luke's gospel. And then look a little bit at how Luke approaches the passion of Jesus before moving on in the next lecture to talk about the acts of the apostles. Um, so there are three, the, three key themes that we find articulated through Luke's gospel, and they're illustrated well from this passage, Luke 4, 16 through 30. Um, this is a passage where Jesus returns from his 40 days of temptation in the wilderness. Um, and he returns to read from the book of Isaiah in the synagogue and ends his reading by proclaiming that the, um, by proclaiming that the coming of the Messiah had been fulfilled, that the coming of the, of the Messiah that had been expected had been fulfilled. And this leads to profound uproar among the leaders of the synagogue. What is this man coming in preaching proclaiming this arrival of the Messiah and the reign of God, the realm of God. Um, but in this passage, you see three key themes. One of those is the fulfillment of prophecy. Isaiah believed that the Messiah was to be a servant of God, a servant of the work of God's new creation in the world. Um, Jesus spoke in this passage, spoke in Luke, and speaks in this passage as one who fulfilled God's promises. Um, Matthew, by contrast, focused on prophecy in terms of the happening of predicted events. Luke's gospel is much more focused upon the embodiment of Jesus himself as the prophet who announces himself the justice and liberation of God's people. Um, and so Luke a lot of times is compared to Moses um, as one who led the people out of Egypt and into God's liberating work of justice through the promised land back in Exodus. Um, so you see here, Luke, it, it, the first key theme is the fulfillment of prophecy. Then the second key theme is empowerment by the Spirit. Um, the Greek word for spirit that Luke uses is pneuma. Um, and literally, that is the Greek transliteration of the word ruach, which is used throughout the Old Testament to mean generally, um, it translates as the movement of air, like wind. So it can mean wind, but it can also mean breath, vital or natural power, um, feelings and will. Um, ruach, as used in the Old Testament, refers to the power that moves you. For Jesus to say that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him is to say that he is a human being that is completely emp empowered and moved by the will of God. He is completely empowered and moved by the Spirit of God, by the breath of God. Um, and so there is nothing you kind of just out there about the Spirit talk. When we think of the Spirit, we think of this like ghost-like thing, ethereal. No, for Luke... Spirit talk is very concrete. Jesus is saying that he comes in the power of God and none other. Um, so we have fulfillment of prophecy. We have empowerment by the Spirit. And finally, in Luke's gospel, we have the emphasis upon liberation and justice. Salvation for Luke is liberation from oppression by powerful peoples and powerful natures. Um, it is clear that Luke believes that liberation is to come not from people, but from God. Um, and so in this way, Luke expresses what is oftentimes in theology, by liberation theology, theologians, called God's preferential option for the poor. We see this emphasis upon the poor throughout Luke's gospel, um, and the priority of the poor given in the reign of God. So look at um, the Beatitudes 6, 20 through 22, when he says, 
Matthew says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Luke said, blessed are the poor, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Um, blessed are you who are poor, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So one thing we can discuss in this discussion questions is what is this poverty and just what does it mean to be poor and to be blessed as one who receives the reign of God. Finally, in Luke, when we look at Jesus' passion, um, a lot of times uh, people point out that Jesus' passion narrative is very calm and serene. He goes to death very silently. He goes without a fight. Um, a lot like a martyr who is dying for his cause. Um, and so a lot of people interpret Jesus as the first Christian martyr. Um, the Greek word martyr simply means witness, um, and is used to refer to anyone whose words or actions are to be, made, to be interpreted as um, a witness to the point of death, to the truth of the gospel and the truth of God's work in the world. Um, but I think it's important when we look at Luke's death to not think of Luke as dying for a cause. I'm sorry, Jesus, not Luke's death, Jesus's death. <laughs> to not think of Jesus as dying for a cause, um, but to think of his whole life as a kind of abandonment to the will and a will of God and an, an abandonment of obedience to God. Um, so perhaps why Jesus is so serene and stoic in all of this is because Luke is all about being obedient to God's purpose and not fighting against that and not fighting the powers of this world because it is God through the death and resurrection of Jesus that will overcome the powers of this world, not Jesus himself as a human being, not human beings themselves. Um, two key passages to consider here are Luke chapter 20, 22. Um, verses 39 and following, where Jesus says, prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, struggles with this idea that he is going to be led to the cross and says, not my will, but your will be done. And then 23, 46, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Luke uh, portrays Jesus as going to the cross completely abandoned to God completely abandoned to the Father of God and is moved not by himself, but is moved by the Spirit of God who leads us into true freedom. And so it is in this light that in Luke, the term Son of God is of such importance. Of all the Gospels, Luke uses the term Son of God to define and identify Jesus. Jesus is identified as the Son of God fundamentally as a prophet of God, as one who is revealing God to the world, um, and as one who is sent to do God's work of accomplishing salvation by liberating oppressed peoples from the power of political oppressors. And that liberation comes through service and servanthood in which we are given over to the will of God. And it is in being given over completely to the will of God that the New Testament witnesses that we are children of God. And so above all, Jesus is that child of God who is the son of God. Um, it's that Jesus that will define then how Luke portrays the church in Acts, um, which is what we'll look at in our next lecture. Right.